<clears throat> Genesis chapter number 6, look with me here at verse number 5. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The title of the sermon this morning is the wickedness of man. The wickedness of man. So I had mentioned, of course, a few weeks back, there's been a running, uh, you know, uh, an informal running series on Sunday morning, just preaching foundational truths of the Bible, some of the foundational doctrines that we stand for. And this morning, I'm going to be preaching on the subject of the sinful nature of mankind. The sinful nature of mankind. I want you to turn back to Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three. Now, things like this may feel like, hey, I don't need to hear this. You know, uh, you know I, I, I know this so well. This is a subject that you know, I'm so familiar with. You know, we need to be reminded about all doctrines in the Bible. You can always learn more about every single subject in the Bible. And we need to keep and continue preaching the Word of God and keep going back through it. And the, the more you grow in one area, like, you know, uh, whatever area this may be, a, a new understanding of a doctrine... That's going to also help you in a completely independent doctrine, a totally other doctrine. You're going to be able to learn more in that as well because all doctrines are ultimately tied together. All the doctrines uh, you know, uh, that the Bible teaches, all the teachings in the Word of God are all related. So when you learn and you grow in one doctrine, that particular new truth, whatever it may be, will help you to understand another doctrine in the Word of God. So when you go back to that, maybe a basic doctrine like the sinful nature of man, you may be able to grow an understanding because of what that other nugget of truth that you had learned elsewhere. Now this is an extremely important subject because it is strongly related to the subject of salvation. And I'm going to get into this shortly, uh, you know, later on in the sermon, but this is one of the reasons why the majority of so-called Christianity is not saved because of their misunderstanding of the state that man lives in. I want you to look with me, as I said, here in Genesis chapter number 3. Now, as you're probably familiar with, Genesis chapter number 1, Genesis chapter number 2 records the creation of the world, which this would include the creation of mankind. God takes Adam, God takes Eve, and they are put, they are placed in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, their purpose is to dress it. I want you to look first with me at Genesis 2, verse number 15. It says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the, into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now I want you to pay close attention to verse number 16. It says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So if you notice there in the beginning of verse number 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man. This is the very first commandment that was ever given to mankind. This is the very first time that the law was instituted. There was a command that was given to Adam. And that specific command was, hey, you can freely eat of every tree of the garden. Any one that you want. Any of your own volition, your own will, just choose of all of them that you want, of your own desire. But there's this one tree, the tree you know, of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that particular tree, you are not allowed to eat of that. So he gave a command and something was off limits that you could not do. And that's basically what you know, the law is. There are certain things that you are commanded not to do. There are certain things that are off limits for you to do. Now, right here we see, as I said, the very first command. I want to give you the definition of sin. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 4. It says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. And then it tells you this, for, meaning because, sin is the transgression of the law. Now the word transgression just means to break or to cross over a line that, you know, is, is off limits, as I said. So what's the definition of sin? It is the transgression of the law. Law and commandment are obviously, you know, interchangeable here. So that is what a sin is. It is to break a command. It is to transgress the law or to transgress the commandment. I want you to look at me. Look with me now at Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three, verse number one. The Bible says this. Now the serpent, it's of course Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, 
Yea, hath God said, so he's questioning the word of God, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now this story is of course a very deep passage. This is of course the record, you know, you know, the personal record of you know, the people Adam and Eve and how they personally sinned for the first time. But not only that, obviously this is how sin was brought into the world. This is a very significant passage of how the first sin actually brought you know, or the first sin that was brought into the world and then death was brought in by as a result of that. And what this is, is this, this is also a illustration or a demonstration of all of mankind's sinful nature. This is actually a play-by-play -play or step-by-step -step process of how you sin in your life, of how we all sin in our lives, and how, deep, how deeply seated this sinful nature is within us. Now, number one, I want to go through the step-by-step -step process of that. I want to, I'm going to quote to you in James chapter number one, verse number 15. The Bible says this. I'll read this. It says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And that is exactly play-by-play -play what took place here. The Bible says in verse six, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we see there the lust, we see there the sin, and then also afterwards following, we know that because of the sin, what happened? They died. In the day that you eat thereof, they were told, you shall surely die. So this is actually the moment when death was brought into the world. We can see that their innocence fades. This is very interesting. Immediately, look at verse number 7. It says this. This is the result. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You know, as I said, this is a picture of mankind. This is a picture of, of each and every one of us can relate to this because it was a moment in which you understood right and wrong in your life. Now whether you can recall that or not, there was a moment when you knew when something was right and when you knew when something was wrong and you personally chose to break that commandment. You knew whether or not you were taught this repeatedly from you know, uh, growing up in a Christian home or whether or not it was just your, the law written in your heart and your conscience also bearing witness to it. There was a time when you knew that it was wrong to lie or you were, there was a time when you knew that it was wrong to take something from someone else that was not yours and you chose to do so anyways. And the Bible teaches, just like we see here, what happened to Adam and Eve, there's a time when your eyes were opened. There's a time when your eyes were opened that the world is not just this, this perfect place, right? And they understood right from wrong at this time. This was actually the first time when the world fell, you know, if the, the sinful nature came into the world and they realized sin and they realized right and wrong, their innocence was gone. They looked at themselves, they, they understood, and they knew that they were naked. Furthermore, verse number 8, it tells you this. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And it says this, And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, why did they hide themselves? Because they were guilty. Because they had realized 
that they had done that which is wrong. They realized that they had broken God's commandments. So you can see all of these things being taught in just these few verses from the perspective of, of Adam and Eve's first sin. And it really is an ideal example, or it is the epitome of all of mankind. Now I want to ask you a question. This is pretty interesting. If you stop and really think about it, you may have contemplated this or not. What, were they given a difficult commandment to keep? No. It seems extremely easy, doesn't it? it seems simple. It seems extremely not difficult at all. It's like you can eat of everything and you're in paradise. Eat, choose whatever you want. You can eat anything that you want at all, period. Just go. You can eat of that tree, that tree. You can eat this, you can eat that. There's just one tree. Just one tree. You know, it's not like they're starving, right? There's just this one tree that you're not allowed to eat of. Does that seem simple or does that seem difficult? It seems, it seems extremely simple, doesn't it? Extremely simple. But what was the result of that? They ate of it anyways, didn't they? That is a picture of mankind. Now that was, that was Adam and Eve, of course, that made the decision. Eve, of course, first, and uh, Adam following. But you know what? You would have done the same thing. The flesh that Adam had and the flesh that Eve had is the exact same flesh that you're wearing today. Obviously, you are a product of Adam and Eve. You know, they, they, they brought you forth. You know, many years ago, Adam and Eve you know, uh, were put upon this earth, and we're a result of that today. You have the exact same flesh that they had. You have the exact same nature that they had. And if you were put in the Garden of Eden, I want you to wrap your mind around this. You're no different. You would have ate of that tree as well. You know what it does when you look at this story and you see how simple that it was in order not to break this one commandment? You know what that should teach you and tell you and help you to understand? How deeply seated that sinful nature is in you. And it's a very, it's a self-righteous attitude because there are many people who probably read this story and, 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 and you know, and I even, I'm not going to say that I haven't read this story and thought, man, it seems ridiculous that they weren't able to eat of that tree. You know, that they weren't able to stop themselves, I'm sorry, from eating of that tree. It seems ridiculous that they couldn't just, you know, prevent themselves from, from never touching the tree. But you would have done the same thing. And I would have done the exact same thing. I want you to flip forward now to Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter number 4. So this is just the second generation of mankind. Genesis chapter number 4 verse number 1, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, they, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Of course, that means he murdered him. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Of course, he's lying. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. We are only in the second generation of mankind. I want you to wrap your mind around that as well. This is, this is the third human being that has been generated. The third person that lives upon this earth. And you know what sin that he committed? Murder. We're not very far into mankind. This is the third person. You know, Cain was brought forth and then after that, Abel. I mean, there's only four people on the earth it seems to be. You know, and then, you know, Seth is brought forth and I'm sure they had many other children after that as well. They, they had to have. It was you know, a necessity for us to be here, right? But here's the thing. 
This is the second generation of mankind. Now, it is, it's so far, you know, the, the sinful nature of mankind, does it seem like, uh, or let's just say this, the state of mankind and how, and how God paints the picture of mankind, does it seem to be a pretty picture? Does it seem to be, you know, that, that, uh, that man is, 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 is righteous or he's able to prevent himself or keep abstain from, you know, wickedness? Of course not. If we were to keep reading throughout this chapter right here, it actually, we, you know, we end up seeing that Lamech ends up taking two wives. After we're already told very clearly that, you know, uh, that, that God made man and woman and that man is to, you know, meant to leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. So he ends up doing that and then he also ends up murdering someone and he says that he does it because of his hurt, because someone's trying to hurt him. And then we go through Genesis 5 is just plainly... Uh, uh, is, it, or is just exclusively the generations of mankind at that time. Then we get to Genesis chapter number 6. So we're six chapters in. Now, roughly if you add up the time, you know, it's between like 1600, you know, 1800 years. If you add up the amount of time that takes place from, from the beginning of, of the fall and, you know, when, obviously when Adam and Eve brought forth Cain from that time, until Genesis chapter number 6, it's less than 2,000 years. And that brings us back to verse number 5. Look at verse number 5 again. It says this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now notice that. It says that it was great. What does that mean? Large, very big. Very, it's saying it's, it's, it's largely wicked. The, or the earth is. It's prevalent. The wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is mankind only 2,000 years roughly, and I'm of course rounding there, after God had created the human race. Look at verse number 7. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth. And it says, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. So mankind has went down the toilet so bad. Their, their, their nature is so sinful and wicked just 2,000 years after God had made them that a just God, a God that knows what punishment that they deserve, He is ready to just completely wipe them off the map, virtually. I mean, He saves, obviously, eight of them, but outside of that, He wants to just get rid of the entire human race. This is a picture of the sinful nature of mankind. And one thing that people will often do is that they won't, they'll try to, and this is of course a self-righteous type of attitude, and this is something we need to understand when we're reading through the Bible, is they always will look at these stories and these passages, and they feel as if they are above all of this. And we need to understand that, as I mentioned already, that the same exact heart that the men in Genesis chapter number 6 have is the same exact heart that you have today. Jeremiah chapter number 17 verse number 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's your heart, my friend. That's everyone's heart. That's every, it doesn't say, it's not just speaking about Israel at that time. It's not just talking about those in Genesis chapter number 6 or just Cain or just this group. That's your heart. That's all of mankind. This is the sinful nature of all of the human race, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If we were to continue to walk through the book of Genesis, this is what we would have. We would see Abraham, of course, pop up. You know, and I'm skipping, skipping a few things. We would see Abraham pop up. And one of the major sins that Abraham committed was adultery. And he did so while you know, f you know, uh, uh, falling away from faith in the Lord during this period of time. So he committed adultery and not only that, he deceived Abimelech about his wife saying, hey, that's not my wife. And was going to allow Abimelech or someone else to take his wife, it seemed as if. Then we see Isaac goes and does the exact same thing. He goes and lies and says, hey, she's not my wife, she's my sister. Of course, learning that from his father. Then, you know, the, uh, the next child, the next generation is Jacob, who supplants and uh, beguiles his brother. Of course, he does so for the birthright. And then, uh, you know, it, uh, it goes on. And, and Esau, his, his brother, Jacob's brother, Esau then, because of that, desires to kill Jacob. Seems as if he would have killed Jacob if he would have had the opportunity. Jacob flees away. Jacob ends up having four wives. So, you know, Jacob is committing adultery as well. Then, uh, in the midst of that, Laban 
And this is horribly wicked. Laban deceives Jacob. Jacob is expecting to be marrying Rachel. He deceives Jacob and sneaks in his other daughter, Leah, and Jacob sleeps with, you know, he, he, he uh, uh, has relations with Leah before he even finds out that it's Leah. So, you know, th I mean, that's extremely wicked. So that's, that's another thing that took place in the midst of all of that. You know, uh, then you have obviously the things that took place with Jacob's children. You know, Dinah committed adultery. And then in that exact same scenario, connected to, the, to that same situation, you have the, uh, the other brothers, uh, you know, the brothers of Dinah. They lie to, you know, uh, Hamor and Shechem. And they tell them, hey, you know, we'll give Dinah to you if all you guys are circumcised. Right? These are the twelve, these are the patriarchs of the twelve tribes of Israel, right? So then they go and they all circumcise themselves, and they and, and uh, uh, Simeon and Levi go in and kill every last one of them. They go, they go in and they just sl they slew the entire family, the whole entire city. Right? And then those same men take one of their brothers. They throw them in the pit and they're like contemplating and devising a plan on how they're going to murder their own brother. How they're going to kill their own brother. And the, and the only reason why they don't kill their brother is because they're like, you know what? You know, what profit is it if we just, you know, you know, just kill him alone? Let's at least make some money off this guy. Let's at least sell him. So they take their flesh and they would have murdered him. And the only reason why they didn't go ahead and kill him themselves is because they just want, they, they, they thought, well, it'd be better for us. I mean, we can at least get some money out of it, right? Then they sell their own brother into slavery and they make money off of it. And you could just continue going down. We could go into Exodus. We could look at Moses, who was a murderer. I mean, the entire story. And you got to stop and you got to think about this. Number one, these are not heathen. These are not the people that are, when I say heathen, I'm saying these are not, these are, the, these are the children of God that are doing these types of things. This is the story of Christians. This is the lifestyle and the things, the different things that Christians did in their life. Now, obviously, they did a lot of great things too. But these are, these are major sore thumbs in their lives. You know what it shows you? It shows you the wickedness of man. It shows the sinful nature of man. We're not talking about the Philistines, some random person of the Philistines. Not only is this the children of God, but these are specifically men of God that God chose to use. Obviously, these would be the greater men of God. God is, you know, the Bible talks about those that were used in the Old Testament that spoke and, and wrote down Scripture that they were holy men of God. These were men that were set apart for God's purpose. They were greater men of God. You know, you, you, can, you can look and see the Ezekiel and all of these different men. You know, in comparison, they're living more clean lives than all of the others, right? But even still, what do we see? These are not small sins, my friend. These are not just white lies. It is major sins in these people's lives. Major wickedness in, pe in these people's lives. And you have pastors all across the United States of America who are standing up and they're preaching to their congregation, you know, whether it be Pentecostal or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, just virtually every, you know, uh, denomination of Christianity teaches some sort of works-based salvation. And they're standing up and they're telling people that, hey, if you smoke cigarettes, you know, you're going to burn in hell. If you do this, you know, if you, you know, whatever it may be, if you go out drinking, you know, I'm not condoning of these things. So don't go buy you a pack after, you know, services today, right? You know, so obviously that's wicked. Man. But it, it, you can just see the ignorance of these basic foundational truths in the Bible when you have Moses who is a murderer in the Bible, who is a man of God. You have all of these horrible things and sins that these men commit. And it shows that if, you, if I were to try to go the route that, that the self-righteous preachers are trying to say in order to get to heaven, no one would make it. Right. No one would get to heaven. God would be in heaven all alone. You know, at least he'd have the Son and the Holy Ghost there with him, right? But it would be, all, it would be empty. No one would be there at all, period. No one. He would, you know, it, no one would be able to make it to heaven if that was the route to heaven. You know, this is part and parcel with understanding salvation. It's understanding first that you're ungodly. And people give lip service to it all the time. Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. You know, for all of sin. And you'll quote these verses to people when you're out soul winning, and they'll quote them back. But then they're sitting there telling you, yeah, I'm trying to be good. It's like, you just said there's none good, no, not one, you fool. People, so these types of, 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 of truths, sometimes you take for granted. 
These types of, and actually understanding them, because that's the difference. Do those people know them? Yeah, because they'll repeat them to you. But there's a major difference in knowing stuff. They know the Bible says there's none good, no, not one, don't they? They know that. But do they actually understand it? No. They say it, but then they contradict it. You ask them, they'll tell you there's no, none good, no, not one. And then later in that exact same conversation, you'll ask them, what do you believe you got to do to get to heaven? Or maybe they'll just slip up and say, well, you got to be good. It's like you just said there's none good, no, not one. Obviously, you don't understand that. You know, so... Sometimes you take these truths for granted. Sometimes you, know, you, can, you can take these things for granted and not realize this is one of the main reasons why you know, half of, you know, not even half, you know, 90% of so-called Christians, if not higher than that probably, are going to hell. Because they do not truly grasp how deep the sinful nature of man is. They don't understand the sinful nature of man when taught in the Bible. I want you to look with me now. Go with me to... Uh, Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 11. Psalm chapter number 40, verse number 11. David is you know, uh, known as being a man after God's own heart. And let's see how his life was, how clean of a life that he lived. Of course, we know that you know, he committed adultery and then murdered someone as well. And you know, I was talking to a man, I was with Brother Anthony yesterday, and he was, uh, I don't remember exactly, I think he, 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 maybe he mentioned right then at that point, because I know he brought it up at another time. It's obviously riding on his conscience that, uh, you know, he was worried about smoking pot wouldn't let him into heaven, right? So I think this may have been when he brought that up. And I was, at the time, he brought this up while I was in the midst of discussing the fact that being a good person is not what gets you to heaven. You know, I was explaining the difference between grace and works and these things. And, and I was trying to clarify that to him, right? And, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, but I just feel like, you know, you know, like you can't just do whatever you want. I mean, you, you, you got to, you know, you got to do this. You got to do that. I mean, I just feel like you can't. And he had already admitted to me he's struggling with smoking pot, right? So this is a guy that grew up and his father's supposedly a minister and things like that. And, um, and I told him, I said, so if somebody, I asked him the question, are you saying like if somebody smoked pot, do you think that they wouldn't be able to get into heaven? And he's like, He's like, yeah. Or I asked him a question along the lines of some sin. He's like, yeah, yeah, I don't think you'd be able to go. And I was like, okay, well, if we apply that to the Bible, you know, let's, let's take that logic. What about David? Do you think David's in heaven? And he's like, yeah. I said, David was a murderer and an adulterer. And he was aware of this. He knew some of the Bible. So it just shows this vast contradiction that people have in their minds. Just this major, vast contradiction of, this, of, of what they believe to be Christianity. What they believe to be the route or the way to get to heaven. And you know why? Because they don't understand the true sinful nature of man. They don't understand how deeply seated it is. It, it's, it, what it is, is it's a self-righteous teaching. It's man standing there and thinking that he can be good. Man looking at himself and saying, it's possible. You know what you have to understand in order to get saved? It's not possible. Right. Right. Amen. That's really what you have to understand. All these people, you know what they're struggling with? They still think that it's possible for them to be good enough. And what you have to grasp is that it's not possible. You are so bad and you are so sinful, it's not possible. Amen. And that's what you're struggling with teaching these people half the time. Is helping them to understand when you say, you know, all have sinned, you need to get what that means. All have sinned. When you say there's none good, no, not one, you need to understand, hey, really? You know what it means? You know, this is the category of good. This is the category over here of not good. You're over here. You're not here at all. At all. There's the line, a thick line, and you're here. When God looks at you, you're not good. He sees, and there's no exceptions. Because they still want to try to hold on. You know what I'm talking about. There's, you're not good. You're not at all. What? Well, no. You're not good. There's none good. None. That's you too. None. They don't get it. I'm sure everyone understands my frustration, but it's, it's, this is one of the main things that you struggle with when you're trying to get somebody the gospel. Look at what David said about his own life and his own righteousness. Look at Psalm chapter number 40. I want you to look at me at verse number 11. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Watch verse 12. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart faileth me. I want you to notice how he starts off. He says this, For innumerable evils have compassed me about. And then he says this, 
mine iniquities have taken, I'm sorry, mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. So he's talking about his sin. And he says, mine iniquities have taken hold upon me. And specifically, if you want to get deeper than that, it's not necessarily relevant. He's talking about how he's being recompensed because of his sin by all the, all the evils that are coming upon him. And there's so many because his sins are so many. That's what he means by, for innumerable evils have come upon me. Right? He's saying, all of these evils have come upon me because my iniquities have taken hold of me. He's saying, I'm finally being recompensed for the sin that I've committed. Now, uh, that's why it ties in with this. It then goes on to say this. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Now, the, the innumerable is tying in with the hairs of your head, because the hairs of your head are innumerable, right? You know, that's why it talks about how God knows the, the very number of your, 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 the hairs of your head, right, in the New Testament, because they're, they're innumerable. You know, you know how it, it's, it's virtually impossible to, you know, to count the, the hairs on your head. That's the point, but God knows them. You know, the, except, yeah, Brother Anthony's over here laughing. He's asking for it. No, uh, but, you know, um, yeah, that doesn't mean you guys are sinless. I don't know if that's why this is going on. No, they read this verse and they're like, you know. But but the point obviously is that you 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 look at you look at the hairs on your head and you can realize right in your guys' case the, your beard, okay, and you can realize the amount of sin that you that you have in your life. His point is this: David evidently had a hair full of, ha of uh, a head full of hair. And he's looking at, you know, something that is innumerable. Just, just thousands upon thousands, right? You know, innumerable is also, it talks about like the stars in heaven. It talks about the sand that's upon the seashore. These are things that are innumerable. And then David looks at those types of things in his life and he says this, that is compared to the sin that's in my life. That is compared to the amount of sin that I've committed in my life. He's talking about how the, the evils that are coming upon him are innumerable. Evils is talking about bad things. He's talking about the punishments that are being brought upon him. And he says that, that's because of all the iniquity that I've committed. All the bad things are, that are happening to me is because of all the, the iniquity that I have in my life. All the sin that I have in my life. This is David. This is some, a man that God says is a man after his own heart. These, we're looking at the greater men of the Bible, the greatest men in the Bible. And he says that my sin that I have in my life is innumerable. How foolish is it then for a man to stand up behind the pulpit and to say, you got to be good to get to heaven. you got to live a righteous life to get to heaven. They should be standing up and trying to explain to these people that the sin that you have in your life is innumerable. The sin that you have in your life is as much as the hairs on your head. That is the amount of sin that you have in your life, my friend. That is the, the, how righteous of a life that you live personally. When, when, you know, and, and, but instead you have people standing up and you have them trying to... Trying to, 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 to and you know what they do is this. They always mention these, you know, they always want to mention all of the... When you speak to people, let me word it this way. When you read Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 8 to people, do you know what people are thinking when you read that? And they always say this too, I've never murdered anybody. It's like you are so shallow that that's the only thing that you could point out about that. What about all the other wickedness and sin that is in your life, my friend? Now, you know, I, when I go to Revelation 21, 8, I just point out lying. Because obviously that's something that I can get people to admit because it's so, so, so obvious. And I'm not, I don't follow these people around. Not to say there's not tons of other obvious sins in these people's lives. But that is the one that I know for a fact that I can pin every single person down on. They're not going to wiggle, be able to wiggle out of this. But that's not because they, they haven't committed a lot of those other things in their life. You know, it may be a strange concept to you, but I'm sure you keep soul winning in your whole life. If you haven't already preached the gospel to a murderer, you will eventually. It may sound weird, but you will. I'm positive of that. You know, I'm sure you've, commit, you've preached the gospel to a whoremonger. They're on the list. A whore. I'm sure you have. You know, I'm sure you've preached the gospel to a fornicator, to an adulterer. These are major sins. Major, major wickedness. And people always, they always want to try to, but even still, it's always whatever is a more major sin than what they've committed, they always want to say, well, I've still never done this. They just keep climbing this ladder of wickedness, but they still want to point to this other sin that's a little bit higher than what they haven't done yet. You know why? Self-righteousness. That's why. That's why these, these, these pastors will stand up and they'll tell you, hey, like I mentioned earlier, you know, 
you know, they, and this is common. What pe they will preach literally, if you smoke cigarettes, you're going to hell. The only reason you're saying that is because you don't smoke cigarettes, you stinking self-righteous false teacher. That's all that it is. This whole attitude is just of pride and self-righteousness. That's all that it is. And, they, and people still feel as if they were good. You know what David said? He said, my sins are so many, they're innumerable. You can't even count them. He's like, and he looks around in his life and he says, you know why this is all coming upon me? Because of all the wickedness that's in my life. All the sin that I've committed in my life. That's a humble attitude. That's an attitude that we should have. Man. You know, when something happens in our life, a good thing to do is to, is to examine yourself like the Bible talks about. Stop and examine yourself. You know, just like the disciples were, were, that were sitting at the, the table at the Passover. You know, the Last Supper with Jesus. You know, when he's sitting there, he's talking about, one of you guys are going to betray me. And they're so humble and they understand their sinful nature so much. You know what they say? Lord, is it I? That's humbling. To where they're like, Peter is literally right previously before this saying, I'm, you know, or actually it's right after this. He says it multiple times, a few different times. He says, I'll never forsake you. But all the disciples are contemplating, Lord, is it I? That is the attitude of a person that understands their true sinful nature. Understanding that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The same heart that exists in Genesis 6, the same heart that you have pumping blood through your body today. The same flesh and the same lusts that Eve had and desires that she had when she looked at that tree are the same lusts that are in your eyes. There's no difference at all. It's exactly the same. Same exact gene code, nothing's different at all. You need to understand the true extent of our sinful nature. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter number 7. So we see David and then who, who came after him? Of course, Solomon is his son. He authored the book of Ecclesiastes. He authored three books. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know, that's not good. That's not holy, right? That's, 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 he, you know, it's terribly wicked on many, many levels. You know, he, he did all other kinds of stuff. He's building uh, temples for false gods. This is the son of David. This is the son of David. I mean, you could go down through the list of just every... The whole book of the Kings, it's, it's, it's a bloodbath. The book of the Kings is a bloodbath where brother is killing brother, mother is literally killing her children, Athaliah. There's so many examples. It is a bloodbath and a struggle for power and for riches because of the lusts that lie in man's heart. There's no difference between you and them. The book of Judges is just a, a, a stinking, just reciprocating a uh, 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 roller coaster the whole entire time. It's just an incline and then a decline. An incline and a decline. You know, God will send someone to save them when they cry and He's only being merciful to them in the first place. They, they get, you know, what happens is they turn from the Lord, they get into vast wickedness, serving Satan, Baal, and then they end up, because of that, God turns His, you know, back to them. They're, they're being, you know, uh, uh, punished by the Lord by being put into slavery and all other types of things, and then they cry out to the Lord, and only because of His mercies, He then goes and brings them out of that. And you know what happens immediately thereafter? They turn back and they do the exact same thing again. It's, it, it happens oh, like probably maybe, uh, I'd say around 12 times in the, just in the book of Judges. Now, those sins that are recorded about these great men of God, that, that, that you know Moses and David and all of them, that they committed, that's just what's recorded, my friend. That, these are just, just what the Bible tells you that they did. That's not all of the wicked thoughts that they had in their heart. That's not all of the other wicked things that they did that God chose for whatever reason not to tell you about. These are just the things that we know because God revealed it unto us. God wanted us to know of it, that we could learn from it. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7 verse number 20 says this, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That's, that is a powerful verse. There is not a just man upon the earth. Is there anybody that's just? Not one. There's not a just man upon the earth. It says that doeth good. Same thing, there's none good, no, not one. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Go to Ecclesiastes 9. 
Verse 3. <coughs> This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Now notice that. What do you know what your heart is full of? It's just the sons of men. It's everyone that has, that, that has come from mankind, right? It's all of man is what it's saying. Your heart's full of evil. It's desperately wicked as Jeremiah 7 says. Go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah chapter number 59. The whole purpose of the law, the reason that the, that the law was given in the first place was to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. You know, Paul says, I had not known sin without the law. The whole reason that the law was given was to show him that he was a sinner. You know, that, that sin might be exceeding sinful. So there's this line drawn, and when you pass that line, you transgress that line, it's so obvious and there's no way that you can get out of it. You know, the whole purpose, think about that, the whole purpose or the primary purpose, at the very least you could say, was to show you how wicked you are. God gave the law to Moses so that the, the Israelites would know, I'm a sinner. I'm ungodly. God gave the law to uh, the nation of Israel and they received you know, all, you know, all of the, uh, the commandments that were given to them, the Ten Commandments, all, every last one of them. They were, they were given to them to show them that they couldn't keep them. So it was a schoolmaster, it was a teacher to bring us unto Christ. The whole purpose of the law is to show you that you are not good enough to get yourself to heaven. Those are God's standards. This is perfection. This is what God says is good. And you know what we see is man breaking the commandments repeatedly. Breaking the commandments repeatedly. You know, uh, let's go to Isaiah 60. Or Isaiah 59, I'm sorry. Isaiah 59, look at verse number 1. I want to read through these. There's quite a few verses right here. Isaiah 59, look at verse number 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Now watch this. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They have cock cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He, I'm sorry, they hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He, he that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their, we, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. 
It says, And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Now, who authored the, this book? We're told it tells you, the book of Isaiah. It's not even a guess, right? We're told that Isaiah is the one that saw these, these visions. Now, if you would have noticed while you were reading through there, he doesn't say they, they, they. You know what he says? We, 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 repeatedly. Over and over and over again. We, 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 this. You know, look at verse 10. We grope. Look at verse 11. We roar. Look at verse 12. For our transgressions. You know why? Because this included Isaiah as well. When Ezekiel sat down and he authored the book of Ezekiel, you know, he makes the, the famous quote, and it's coming from God, of course. It says that God, God makes the statement. He said, I looked for a man among them to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. You know what he says? And found none. He says, I found none. It's interesting, and I've pointed this out before, that Ezekiel had to pin that down. You know who that included? He says none. Obviously, the point of all of this is to point us to Christ. That's why he says it right here. You know, he goes on and says and he, in verse 16, And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. You know what the man is to stand in the gap? It's a man to make up the edge. You know who the man was? The only man that could have ever done it. It was God himself as a man. That was, this is one of the things that this is supposed to point us to. When you read about the wickedness of man all throughout the Old Testament, it's supposed to have you prepared for when the second man comes, the perfect man. I want you to go now to, we're going to go to Isaiah 64 and then Romans 3. We're going to end in Romans 3. Go to Isaiah chapter number 64, the famous verse on this subject. But we are all as an unclean thing. And then it says this, and all our, notice he's still speaking about himself as well. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. I want you to go to Romans 3 now. Romans chapter number 3. We're going to end, actually, in Romans chapter number 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. We're going to skip some of it. We'll, we'll begin... Um, Let's begin in verse number 9. Verse number 9 says this. This is really where the context began. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So he's talking about Jew and Gentile. And Gentile is what? It's defined as the nations of the world. So you have the nations of the world and then you have the Jews. So when you say Jew and Gentile, you know what you're talking about? Everyone. All of mankind. And he begins by saying, there is none righteous, no, not one. He says, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's Jew, Gentile, that's everyone. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Sometimes self-righteousness stops you from applying these things to yourself, but that's you. That's every single person in here. This is speaking about you. This is speaking about mankind. There's deceit in your mouth. There's, po there's the poison of ass in your lips. This is all of mankind. This is your flesh. This is everyone, Jew and Gentile. Keep reading, verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Notice, all the world. Verse 20, Therefore, that means consequently, because of everything that we, we just learned. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. 
For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Do you know why he just explained all of that? Do you know the whole reason why he explained how sinful you are? Was so that he could help you to understand that you're not going to get to heaven by being good. Amen. That you're not going to get to heaven by your own works. This is, the, this is the whole reason why he mentioned it. So that he could then conclude and say, therefore. So because of how wicked and sinful you are, now that you understand the extremity of your own sinful nature, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Look at verse, um, verse number... Just read verse number 28. Verse number 28 as well. This is another good one where he just, he just concludes this, and I'll use this all the time out soul winning. It says this, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now how did he come to that conclusion? This is what I want, I want to conclude the sermon on this, this, this morning. How did he come to that conclusion? This is super important. By first helping the reader to understand that you're sinful and you're wicked and you are not good. This is an extremely important doctrine. Understanding the sinful nature of mankind. Same thing happened with Adam and Eve. They, they wouldn't have stayed in paradise and neither, neither would you. You know what happened was they sinned, they broke God's commandments. You know what they needed? They needed, they needed grace, they needed mercy. And God was the one that had to redeem them. All of us, we sinned, we broke His commandments, and we need the Lord. Because of your sinful state, therefore we conclude. If you were able to look at your life and really understand, just like able to see just all the sinful filth that, that we've all committed, you were able to look at it, you know what you'd say? You'd look at that and then you'd say, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That for sure isn't going to be the way that I get to heaven. If you, if, you know, if, because you know, here's the thing. Even still, because of our sinful nature, that's what actually pushes you to this self-righteous type of attitude. That's what causes people in the first place not to admit the, their sinful nature. Not to even admit it is because of pride. It's because of self-righteousness, wanting to still look at themselves and say, hey, look at me. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, um, the desire to not be humble. That's what it is. It's the lack of humility. So a couple of things that we can walk away from is this. Number one, this is important to under, an important doctrine because of salvation, because it's, it is part and parcel with salvation. We need to make sure that we help a person to understand and that they, they truly get it. That you're not good. You know, I'm not just being pious. You're really not good. You know, you really are sinful. You really are wicked. You know, and if you, if you knew, I've, I've said this statement before. I, I hijacked this from somebody else. If I knew all the things that you've done and all the things that you've thought in your mind, I wouldn't waste my time preaching to you. And if you knew all the things that I've thought and all the things that I've done, you wouldn't want to listen to me preach to you. We don't truly know. And that's why I always make the statement. I think it's a good statement when I'm giving the gospel. I, I, of course, first show them that, hey, we're all liars. But then I look at them and I say, and if we were to be honest, we've done a lot worse things than that. And every person's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't want to divulge that. That's what they're thinking, but okay, I admit it. A lot worse things than that. Our heart is, is, is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. Just like Genesis 6, you know how it talks about the thoughts of man. It's the same heart. It's evil continually. So we need to understand... You know, how sinful we are. We need to understand that, 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 you know, what nature that we possess. And we need to be able to teach this. You know, obviously you don't need to preach a sermon, but you need to make sure when you're, when you're giving, you know, the gospel, number one, that they understand truly you're really not good. Truly really not good. Right? Number one. Number two, we need to be grateful for our salvation because of this. It, it should cause you to be grateful. You know, uh, I just thought of this. I'll read this to you. Romans 5, uh, verse number 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then it says this, For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, one would, we, would even dare to die. Saying like, it's scarce, like it's rare for a righteous man. That means a man that's without sin at all, period. 
That's what that's saying. It's scarce that, a right, that, that for a righteous man one would die. And then it says, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. It's repeating the same thing. Then it says in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So notice how he starts off first explaining like, no one is even willing to die for a perfect man. But you know what Christ did? He died for the ungodly. Amen. He died for the wicked. Amen. He died for those who have you know, uh, uh, innumerable sins in their life. He was still willing to die for you. Amen. So you know what it should do? It should cause you to be grateful. When you understand, you say, what, you know, what, what can I learn from, like I started the sermon off? Because people have these thoughts. You know, I'm sure someone in, in here thought, what can I learn from this? You know, learning about the sinful nature of man? I hope not. But you know, here's the thing. You know what you can learn? When you truly understand your sinful nature, you can walk away and say, hey, I'm that much more grateful for my salvation. Amen. You're right, I am ungodly. I am pretty stinking wicked, right? You can walk away and you can be that much more grateful for your salvation. And let me end with this, though. Obviously, this, this doesn't give you, you know, uh, a free pass to, oh, I'm wicked, I can just keep being wicked. Obviously, that's, that's an even worse attitude. You know, you, we, should, we should keep God's commandments because we love Him. Amen. If you love me, keep my commandments. There still, you know, is, is still, just because we possess this sinful nature, that doesn't make it all right. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. It's still sinful. It's still wicked. It's still wrong. It's still terrible. So just because we possess the sinful nature, you know what we should do? We should crucify the flesh daily. We should show God that we love Him. You know what we should do? I, be thankful also that we have the Holy Spirit today. And that can guide you and help you to live a more holy life. We can, that, the, that we have the ability to walk in the Spirit in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. You know, be thankful for that. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We thank you so much for everything you've done for us. We thank you uh, that, that you were willing to die for the ungodly, dear Lord. And, and uh, we ask you that you would uh, be with us and help, uh, help none of us to have a self-righteous attitude. Uh, you know, uh, as, as your word says, Therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Help us to understand uh, how sinful we are and what we are capable of doing. And uh, help us to guard our heart, to guard our mind. Help us not to use this uh, just as uh, an excuse to just continue in sin but help us to crucify the flesh daily and help us by understanding how sinful we are to, to try and, you, and, and to, uh, to uh, use this to motivate us to live a more holy and more godly life uh, than we live today. We love you and be with us and bless the day, dear Lord, and help uh, many people to be saved. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.